gender is one of those things that we use a lot, but we're not entirely sure what is it that we are talking about. So stay with me. We've already heard this morning that Mrs. Chinri Hesse became our first female chancellor. She's been working at Legon since 1989. It's been a hard road that we have traveled to get women to be in places, not just at Legon, not just in Accra, not just in Ghana, but in the world. And Mrs. Chinri Hesse's firstness bears some celebration. So let me just tell you two of her firsts. She's been the first African woman resident coordinator of the United Nations system and resident representative of the UNDP in several countries, including Sierra Leone, Tanzania, the Seychelles, and Uganda. And in 1989, she was appointed as the first woman deputy director general of the International Labour Organization, the ILO for short. And as she said herself in her speech, she catapulted being the first vice chancellor, we've never had a woman vice chancellor. She catapulted being the first chairperson of council, we've never had a female chairperson of council, to become the chancellor, which is the highest office of the University of Ghana. I think we can give her another round of applause. So that was an exciting moment in this week for me. Wednesday, the 1st of August, 2018. And then on Thursday, the 2nd of August, 2018, my spirits dipped. And I promise you what I'm sharing with you is not fake news. Some of you may have come across it. Tokyo University apparently has been systematically blocking women from entering their medical school. And they've used a ratio that will keep female students below 30%. Why? Because apparently if women become doctors, they will get pregnant and have children and waste everybody's time. And so we need more doctors. And yet obviously women don't get pregnant alone. It takes the sperm of a man to make a woman pregnant. But interestingly, that same university allowed the son of one of the ministers of education to get a spot in the medical school, although he didn't make the grades. Wow. This is 2018. Have we come? Or are we still traveling the journey? So this is me in the 1980s, a student at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. I, I entered my architecture class, one of four women out of a class of 20. That makes us about 25%. And I can honestly say that I didn't really experience discrimination from my colleagues or my faculty, my professors. Boys were climbing, we were climbing with them. They were measuring, we were measuring with them. I don't remember any sexual harassment of myself or my female colleagues. And yet, nonetheless, we kept getting these messages. I tell you, cry, I go marry, where you go born. So this degree, what thing go make do? And you're thinking, really? And this is when my feminist orientations began. As I realized that things were not equal for men and women. And simultaneously, I became a Christian. And people were telling me that feminism and a Christian faith could not live together in the same house. And so it became troubling for me. Because I knew that I had to be a feminist and I had come to this Christian faith from research and persuasion. And then fortunately for me, I discovered this verse in Galatians 3.28 that says, 
There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither female nor male. We've all been created equally in the image of God. And as I read the Bible some more, I began to think that this Jesus guy, make like he'd be feminist. He's hanging out with women that other people don't feel cool with. Some prostitutes here and there. Some women that rabbis are not supposed to be seen with. Including them among his disciples. Allowing a woman to be the first to see him after he got resurrected. I'm like, these guys in the church, they are not necessarily telling us the truth. So we've gone through different historical moments to come to this gender place that we are right now. Different waves of feminism. There's some first wave, then there's some second wave, then some third wave. So who at all is a feminist? Because that word evokes some discomfort. And even among the many young women that I know, you would think by their actions, by their words, that they are feminists. They're like, hmm, not too comfortable with that word. Because when you say that you're a feminist, it evokes images of a woman who hates men, who can't have a good relationship with a guy, who doesn't want to have children, all kinds of negative things. So for me, who's a feminist? Feminist is someone who, one, recognizes that the playing field is not equal. That the society and the culture that we live in has different demands for women and men, different expectations, different ways of measuring us, different ways of valuing us. And secondly, a feminist doesn't just recognize that that's the story, but a feminist does something about it. In the classroom, in her theater, in his songs or spoken word, in the pictures that she paints, in the stories that he tells. She or he wants to change not only the playing field, but the rules of the game, the coaches, the managers. That's a feminist for me. And so what are some of the things that as feminists we can celebrate? In the so-called first wave, feminists looked at issues of equal opportunity. Women should be able to have the same access as men do. So in some countries it had to do, for example, with getting the votes. It might interest you to know that in Switzerland, women only got the vote in 1971. Imagine. The second wave of feminism linked theory building and advocacy. So those of us in the academy are not just talking plenty. But we are linking the theory to action, to policy, to advocacy to making sure that the images that we see captured in the news are different, change the game. For example, in my own teaching, in the Institute of African Studies that has been my home since 1989, we talk about the impact of colonialism and how that undermined women's authority as traditional leaders to a place where today, Women traditional leaders don't have the same space in the House of Chiefs that men do. Well, the British came and understood and expected and wanted only to work with male leaders. So that has had implications for us. Colonialism came and said that men and women in marriage should be arranged in particular ways. Women should stay at home and have babies and men should go out and work. Yet, if any of you are old enough to remember your grandmothers or great-grandmothers, they sit at home and just look pretty and look after babies? No, women have always been working. 
third wave of feminism can be acknowledged for a lot of the UN w women's conferences and for changes in legislation. For example, a very important piece of legislation is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And states sign on to those, and our country, Ghana, signed on to it. And when you sign on to these international conventions, and you're expected to have local laws that allow women to not be under these forms of discrimination. So in Ghana, for example, one of the issues that women in the movement have worked really hard for is the passage of domestic violence legislation, which happened in 2007. Yay! There's still a lot of work to be done. I'm sure in your communities, you know, domestic violence still goes on. Sexual harassment still goes on. Labeling women still goes on. And which wave are we in right now? I think I'm best be described by something one of my graduate students said, and I quote her. She says, even as the gap is bridged between men and women, they, the men, want to widen it and find ways to bring us down. It has become more of a competition with our male peers. The men don't like the idea that women can do better than them." Unquote. This ways to bring them down often boils down to domestication and sexualizing. And we hear it in the everlasting debates of women having to cook and if my wife doesn't cook, and girls in the church, if you don't know how to cook, you will never get a husband. And we've distilled our worth down to cooking and sexuality. The way we dress, the way we look, the way we don't dress, the way we shouldn't dress, the skirt which is too short, the skirt which is too long makes you look too drab. We're sending confusing messages. And our young girls and our young boys are not sure. And sadly for me, who's active in the church and who takes my faith very seriously, the church is becoming one of the sites where we are being even more restricted. If you were to flip channels and listen to some of those preachers, would wonder, excuse me to say, which cave they crawled out of. Because as I read my Bible, and I see that we were both created in the image of God, I'm wondering what all the fear and insecurity about women in leadership, women in pastoring positions, and women teaching men, is all about. This week, this woman is running for president, Eunice Otwejedi. And she had to tell us that she's not a feminist. And we're wondering why in 2018, a woman who's running for office is afraid of the label. Because those men who don't like women, they weren't going to vote for her anyway. She might as well have garnered the women's vote. Actually, I think that one too now, she's lost it. So we're moving and talking about change and our tomorrows. And I think that you're looking at part of your tomorrow because I was my yesterday once upon a time. And I'm thinking about my grandchildren, hopefully, my great-grandchildren. I'm not likely to be alive to meet those if I have any. But what would that future look like? And what does it mean for men? We're talking about feminism. I've been doing some research among young men across the continent. I've been to Uganda, I've been to Kenya, and in South Africa, Accra, different places in Germany, in Canada, talking to young men about what it means to be a man today. The narrative has been the same. 
got to be providers, they've got to be protectors, they've got to be strong, they can't be vulnerable, they mustn't cry. And I remember clearly this conversation in Makare, so-called lower income, euphemism, slum in Nairobi. And I, and I asked them, what if your girlfriend dumps you? Cry for one day, you hang out with your boys, have some drinks, probably watch some sports, and then you're good to go. Men under a lot of stress, a lot of pressure, perform this provider, this protector, this person who doesn't cry. And that's not good for any of us. So what might it look like for my great-grandchildren in 2015 when I would have been buried? It's my vision that our potential will not be limited by gender. Now, since we are equal, male and female in God's eyes, there will be no qualities, skills, competencies, experiences that one or the other gender would be limited from performing. And as Mrs. Chenry Hesse said on Wednesday when she became our first female chancellor, that a day will come when we will not be talking about the first woman this and the first woman that and the first woman the other. But all these positions would have been so routinized that it would be normal to see women. In 2050 or before, our value will not be limited by gender. Our contributions will be measured by who we are and what we can bring to the table, by merit and by performance, and that we will be equally compensated for what we bring to the table. Our value will not be measured by our marital status, married or single, having a child or not having a child. And that, that so-called issue of submission will be about mutual respect and submission. And finally, for today, our sense of self-worth as women and as men, will not be determined by bondage to fixed scripts. And we will get out of the box and say, I can be something else. As a man, I, cannot, I will not be afraid to cook a meal for the women in my life. My mother, my girlfriend, my wife, my sister, my children. And as a woman, I'll not be constrained by women can't do that and women shouldn't do that. By then, men will also dare to be fragile and to declare their vulnerabilities. And women will be able to venture through their pain and get out on the other side still whole and still strong. Thank you so much.